Hey, welcome back to the We Maple Video Show. We're here with Dr. Jenny Ding, founder of Kale Health Canada, takes her well being very seriously and runs up and down those memorial stairs that if you live in Calgary, uh, you know the height and the velocity it takes in which to climb those steep stairs. So that's fantastic. We're going to talk about health today, well being, Jenny's uh, experience with her business. And yeah, welcome to the show, Jenny. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Yeah, for sure. We got introduced by a, by a previous uh, guests group, Nelson mm -hmm. Liam at Exmers. Mm -hmm. What's your experience been like with that group? It's been great, actually. I really had no idea about the whole barter exchange platform until I met Nelson, learned more about that, and the group has been very supportive. Lots of great networking opportunities, and that's how we got connected. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Moise, uh, shout out Moise. With Kale Health uh, Canada then, how does, uh, what typically happens when a new uh, customer comes into Kale Health Canada? Is it an initial consult? Do you bill hourly? Or what's your business model? Mm -hmm. Great questions. So I'm the physician and the founder behind Kale Health Canada. And what we do here is essentially I teach people to eat and live in a way that reverses their prediabetes and type 2 diabetes naturally without medication and our, allow our bodies to heal naturally. Because right now, the environment, whether it's a food environment or our lifestyle, is so different from what our parents, our grandparents are used to. And the way that we're living our life right now may not be the most conducive for health. And so through Kale Health, what we do is to really, really empower each of our clients to take ownership of their health, guide them along the journey to reverse their blood sugar concerns naturally. And so to answer your question, when the clients initially get connected to us, usually I do a complimentary free discovery call with them to make sure that our program is the right fit for them and then discuss some of our offerings and kind of guide them through what their journey will look like once they start their health process with us. Yeah. You touched on something that, I, that I've always found quite interesting is how generations ago how different the lifestyle was where you know as hunters and gatherers by nature or as those that would migrate with either weather patterns or animals depending on which country or part of the world that you're looking in our lifestyles change so much especially mm -hmm. in the western culture where it's like breakfast lunch dinner snacks in between but really the human body was uh, optimized in a different way in the past. What do you think that the impact of that has had on our health? I th um, well, what's happened in the last couple of decades is really we have prioritized productivity and work over other things that would optimize for longevity. So things like rest, eating balanced meals, having frequent breaks during the day, for example, eating three meals a day without snacks like our grandparents or our parents used to do and prioritizing family time. So some of these things that seems very basic, but are so important that we have somehow let it slip through the cracks because of all of the other demands in life these days, right? All of the other um, things that's in our environment, whether it's work, whether it's social media, whether it's all these other distractions that we have that kind of slowly took away from the way that we used to live, than the way that we grew up living. So I think it's super important to kind of have some guidance or some support to help us navigate our way back to the way that our body's meant to function. Yeah. Yeah, and that's sort of the spirit behind Kale Health, right? Is yeah. uh, uh, and you, you mentioned too family time. Is mm -hmm. is our health is so um, based around all those different areas mm -hmm. where you know loneliness, for example, is one of the ways in which a lot of our elderly will will die sooner in life if they're not getting those other buckets filled. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to have the right food, but if you don't have connection, if you don't have love, if you don't have a uh, purpose, yes. then your health can decline much quicker. What are your thoughts on or, or what or your approach on designing a really holistic approach to health? Yeah. And so very, very great points. I always wanted to do something in the realm of 
preventative medicine um, because my view also growing up being Chinese and raised by my parents and grow grandparents in China prior to moving to Canada they really kind of emphasize the philosophy of prevention of optimizing your body your health your lifestyle to mitigate things early on rather than kind of catching up later when you are sick so going back to your question about the whole sense of purpose and community, it is so vital um, to help not only ground us in what we do, but also provide us with the support for keep on doing what we're doing, right? Because we are social creatures. We're not one man army. So we need to have a group of people behind us, with us, to help us achieve our goals, our purpose. So for example, my grandparents, they are in their 80s. My grandpa, he just turned 88 in November. So we all went back to China and celebrated his birthday. It was a big celebration. I think we had 20, 30 relatives coming across from different parts of the country. And my grandparents, they still live in the same complex. My aunt actually ended up buying a new apartment in the same complex about 20 some years ago. So they're kind of next door neighbors. So if they need anything, my aunt is there to help and support them, help them get medications, maybe get some groceries, pick up and doing some errands. And that just having that community of, of people that they know that they're familiar with, I think really contributed to their longevity. And uh, you know their lives are pretty simple. My grandpa, he likes to garden and that's kind of his purpose. And he also likes to make little videos or PowerPoint on this Chinese app that he shares with the rest of the family by the internet. And he's in his, uh, he's 88. So, you know, this is pretty remarkable for somebody in his 80s. So just having some small things that keeps them going, motivated, engaged in life, it's so important. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like a tremendous set of fam family values too. Mm -hmm. the, the example that you used with your aunt, but also to have family come from all over all the world. You've, you've, mm -hmm. You came yeah. to go and celebrate his his birthday. And, and 88, isn't eight a very significant number in, in your culture? It is, yeah. So it's a big celebration. Eight essentially is a very lucky number in um, China. So that's one of the significance behind why it's such an important date for us. Mm -hmm. And wow, and, and uh, you've lived in five cities in Canada, is I that did. right? Yeah. Uh, let's see if we can guess them. So Vancouver? Yes. Calgary? Yep. Um, Toronto? No. Edmonton? No. Yes. Regina? Nope. East of Winnipeg or West? East. Kingston? Close, but not exactly. There's two left, right? There's two left. One of them is the nation's capital. Okay, Ottawa. Ottawa, there Got you go. It, yeah. And another one is way out east. St. John's? A bit further west. So, Halifax? Yes, exactly. Oh, wow, fantastic. Yeah. I grew up in Halifax. Oh, did you? Amazing. Yeah, yeah. What, what part? Uh, did you live right in the city? or? I did, yeah. So when my family immigrated to Canada when I was about 10, we actually landed in Halifax first. And my mom was doing her PhD at Dalhousie, so we just lived around the university. And fast forward <coughs> about you know, 10, 15 years, after I finished my undergrad at UBC in Vancouver, I ended up doing a master's master's degree at Dalhousie myself. So we end up, I, or I guess myself, I end up going back to Halifax for a period of time. Oh, wow. Yeah. I love Halifax because when you get off the plane, at, even just at the airport, there's a distinct mm -hmm. smell of Atlantic Ocean that I I notice. Some, it's not everyone does, but when you get off the plane in Vancouver, I don't notice a Pacific smell, but there's something about Atlantic Canada. I feel like it's got a distinct Atlantic ocean scent yes yes i think so and i feel like almost every city has a little bit of that if you maybe are not from there once you land in the airport get out into the city you do pick up there so something slightly different about whether it's a smell or the feel of it um i have a friend who used to live in hamilton and says that you know hamilton because it's a paper mill and all of the factories kind of smells like that so maybe it's just again the environment kind of has that 
effect on people. 100%. You know? Even uh, if, if you drive uh, through Nova Scotia, I don't know if that plant is still there, but Scott's Paper Mill was mm. there when I grew up in the 90s. And so you'd get close to the area where that was and it would have the smell. I noticed Hong Kong had a very distinct smell. I spent a couple weeks in Shenzhen and that had a very distinct smell. Um, but then other parts of Europe, like Madrid, had a very distinct, not so much a smell, but like a real vibe. Same with London. Um, yeah, have you done any, a lot of international travel outside of Canada to visit other parts of the world? I have. And I guess most of this was done pre-COVID, probably like most people. And so I did some backpacking when I was younger, did the whole Europe thing. Um, Paris, Munich, Frankfurt, um, and then most recently, pre-COVID, I was in Bali for a bit, uh, went to Portugal, loved it. I actually went there because of Harry Potter. I wanted to go see Porto and I uh, love the city, love Lisbon. Uh, it's great, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's that's awesome. There's a another podcast that I follow. I don't know if you know who the Nelk Boys are, uh, but they're out of Toronto. Mm -hmm. They're one of the most popular uh, YouTube channels um, and has become the number two or number three podcast. But they've been trying to get Harry Potter and he doesn't do interviews. Oh. Daniel Radcliffe yeah. does not do a lot of press. And so they've they've put it out there in the yeah. in the ethos. What a what a great series of movies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, you know, have the books. Actually, I have two versions of the book, the original version, and then I ended up buying the new version because I thought I lost the original version that I had when I was growing up. And uh, I, I don't know if you heard about this, but they're coming out with the HBO TV series for Harry Potter. They're going to do a decade-long series with all new actors. Oh, wow. I it's know. like Game of Thrones on steroids. A little bit, yeah. Me. I hope they don't kill off too many characters. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm looking forward to it, actually. Yeah, yeah 10 years. That's a long... Uh, if you get those contracts to be in the show, you're like, oh, sweet. But then if you, they kill you off, you're like, oh. Yeah, exactly. What can you do, right? Yeah, yeah, a great series in Alberta that's being shot is The Last of Us, which is currently mm -hmm. the most expensive TV series ever made. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually haven't watched that too much, to be honest. I'm kind of busy with work and life and all these things and so i in my spare time i don't tend to watch a lot of tv maybe just once day a week uh, my husband and i we would watch something on netflix or something on youtube yeah yeah i don't do a lot either i'll get it really into a show crush it and then like not watch tv for a long time mm -hmm. i find though podcasts or there's a lot of youtubers that i follow and mm -hmm. Just the consumption of it too, like doing five to 10 minute pieces of content instead of having to sit through a whole right. thing. What's the last movie you would have watched to actually sit down and consume a, a whole movie? Oh, the last movie. Well, I'm a bit of a nerd. So I am a lifestyle medicine physician. And I yes, I do work on, um, or I do work in this field. I do help coach clients, patients to live their life healthy, reverse diabetes, all these things. Um, and yet in my spare time, I'm still very much interested in watching documentaries on health. And so there's one, I guess, docu-series about five episodes on Netflix called The You Are What You Eat. It's a twin study out of the United States where they took twins and they gave one a vegan diet, another one an omnivore diet for I believe about 12 weeks and then measure their health metrics before and after the study and basically show the benefits of a plant-based diet, to reduce inflammation, heart disease risk, and all these things. So I watched that recently and I thought that was really interesting. It was pretty well done. And uh, does did the data support that uh, plant based diet? Is uh, did the what were the results of what you what you just described? Carnivore versus plant based. Yeah, so the results are very much in support of plant based diets for reducing inflammation, for reducing um, risks, or I guess aging factors related to aging, helps with in dig uh, digestive health, intestinal health, helps with also long term memory and uh, just overall longevity. So I know a lot of people are very much into um, eating you know, meat products, maybe even fish. There's lots of somewhat misconception out there about the health of eating things like chicken or you know, beef or pork. And 
overall, all the research points to the plant-based diet, it's better for people in the long run than all these meat products, regardless if it's chicken, if it's fish, if it's seafood, all this stuff. So I find that interesting mm-hmm. too. I, I haven't seen that particular series, mm-hmm. but I do do um, just independent study online. And mm-hmm. one of the most healthy cultures uh, in the world is in Northern Canada and all they eat is seal and seal blubber. Mm-hmm. And they consume all of that fat, the blubber, and then they save the meat and eat the meat later, typically raw, right. but they don't have any uh, access to fruits and vegetables. And these uh, small cultures of people have lived, they, they live long, long lives. And so it'd be so interesting to, mm-hmm. uh, to take that study that you just described and then also look at like different pockets in the world. Yes. There's the, the, there's a, I think it's in Taiwan. There's like a small village that has the longest lifespan where a lot of people live to 120. And then they look at their diet. And so it'd be interesting to, to take that thing you just described, that study and like put on steroids and have like globally what, what the most healthy car- cultures are and see who wins. Yeah, I think what you touched on is really interesting because there's been lots of studies that came out uh, recently in the last uh, decade or so showing the importance of epigenetics. So for populations such as those who are indigenous in Northern Canada, their genetics are very different, say, from somebody who is from Southeast Asia. And so growing, so because of this, their diet has also facilitated the expression of certain genes to be optimal for them in that food and lifestyle environment. Versus if you take the same person and plug it plug them into that environment, they may not have the same health outcomes because their genetics are different. And so the expression of their genes will be different. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. There was another study done on just back to Canada on our indigenous history. And when, you know, John Cabot or whoever it was, these groups that came over from Eastern Europe and began doing fur trading with indigenous cultures, there was no alcohol here in Canada. Mm -hmm. And so when alcohol was introduced to indigenous cultures, they didn't have the history of the epigenetics that you're just describing. So it had this tremendous negative impact on their culture because they hadn't developed any sort of tolerance. And so the alcohol was like, you know, too strong. Basically, we had hundreds and hundreds of years of wine and other yeah. things being consumed in in Eastern Europe, and then or in, in parts of Europe, and then can't these these culture had it didn't have it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, alcohol is very much widely available, so easily accessible in so many different places. Um, and uh, you're right; it it does definitely has some health consequences definitely because of just how it affects our body. It is a toxin end of the day. I know there's been some studies showing um, you know, benefits of maybe red wine for longevity and all these things. And I think they're really talking about compounds such as resveratrol. I'm not sure if you heard of those. <laughs> yeah, there are specific component of things such as grapes um, and other vegetables that in high quantities can be beneficial for longevity, for reversing parts of aging. And so there's been some studies saying, oh, we need to drink more red wine because it has this compound in it. So if we drink enough, we're gonna not age and live forever. And so I think there's some controversy because of those things, but the amount of red wine, for example, you need to drink in order to get the amount of resveratrol that's been used in some of these longevity studies, it's like gallons of red wine a day, which is, kind of impossible for most people like without having health consequences so i don't advise that at all so i mean there's definitely other supplements out there that has you know resveratrol and all these things by themselves that people could try without having the alcohol as part of it so yeah mm-hmm. that's interesting i'll check that out mm-hmm. with um kale health canada if a new patient came in and they mm-hmm. said look you know i'm, I'm really having uh, a difficult time sleeping. I mm-hmm. get I get quite tired in the day. Yeah. I'm just picking arbitrary symptoms. What would your approach be at Kale Health to start to assess, uh, you know, how you could help them? What's really interesting is those symptoms that you just listed, you know, feeling really tired during the day, you know, low energy. Those can definitely be symptoms of blood sugar spikes and crashes. So poorly controlled blood sugar in the short term can cause things like chronic fatigue brain fog, food cravings, 
endless hunger, feeling like your bottomless pit, something like that, right? And poor sleep. All these things are usually short-term effects of poorly controlled blood sugar. So if somebody comes to Kale Health Canada and they say they have all these symptoms, but they don't have prediabetes or diabetes, I still recommend them to enroll with our program to see if this is actually related to blood sugar. And most of the time, this is related to blood sugar issues. Um, what's really interesting about the service that we provide is that we leverage the latest health technology. So besides just having initial consultation and regular follow-up with me, we also provide you with access to continuous glucose monitors so that you can see your blood sugar changes in real time based on what you're eating, what behavior you're doing. And so we can really tune in to how your body's responding to all these things and catch, oh, maybe you're feeling really tired. It's actually because of X, Y, and Z that we can see in real time on your blood sugar changes. So that's just one of the many things that we do in Kale Health. Mm. Mm. What mm. about um, artificial intelligence? Are you integrating any, any tools from AI into your business? So at this point, not yet. But that being said, I guess I should say we are not doing it directly yet, but through one of my partners that provides um, gut health testing kits for microbiome and gut health, um, they do use AI in their platform to really find the latest research and evidence um, based on your gut health, the different bacteria profile that shows up, and then make tailored recommendations to heal your gut naturally. So I do use their service. So as a client of Kale Health, you do also get access to the microbiome gut health testing kit because gut health is related to hormones and how we feel and so many different things in our body. So by understanding more of what's going on in your digestion, it also helps us to figure out what's actually going on, for example, with your blood sugar, with your hormones, with your mood and X, Y, and Z. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, got that. With the microbiome, I went pretty deep researching into the microbiome. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it plays such a significant role in our health, the, all those uh, organisms and microbes yeah. that are in there. Uh, what can you tell us about the microbiome? So here's another interesting tidbit. I started Kale Health Canada about maybe over a year ago, a little over that. Initially, it was focused more on general health and wellness around weight management and heart disease reversal around high blood pressure, high cholesterol, all these things. But around summer of last year, I did some blood tests because I was having some weird symptoms of maybe feeling a bit tired, weird energy crashes, and found that I was pre-diabetic, which was a surprise to me because you know I'm in my 30s, um, not overweight, thought I was doing other right things, eating, sleeping, exercising well. I thought I was you know, also working as a lifestyle medicine physician, preaching some of these things to my clients, my patients. And so that's kind of when I started looking into the science and research behind blood sugar and created a program for myself to reverse my prediabetes in about 30 days. And that's kind of when we shifted the services for Kale Health Canada to really focus on diabetes reversal and help people who may not even have diabetes but have these symptoms to get started on their health journey so they don't end up going down that road. Because a lot of them, they, for example, have family members that have diabetes or prediabetes, and they don't want to have that happen to them, right? So really, there's a lot of things that we can do to get started on healing. And actually, I, I'm kind of rambling, so I actually forgot your question <laughs> about this. You know. Is what you could tell us about the microbiome. The microbiome, yes, yeah. So, yeah, so, oh yes, that's where I was going. So I connected with a company um, that provides the microbiome kit and did the test myself and found out that even though my husband and I, we both did the test, I have this one bacteria that is seen in people with poor blood sugar control. And he doesn't. We live in the same house. We eat the same food. I have prediabetes. He doesn't. So that's super interesting. Just 
And then over time, I've shifted my microbiome profile. So that bacteria is no longer in the, the 50 to 80% range. Now it's down in like the 10 to 20% range, which is a lot more in the normal range. And my blood sugar is also much better. So there is definitely an interlink between the two. The bacteria eats what we eat. Basically, every time we eat something, our gut bacteria is eating what we eat. And as a result, they produce output, they produce hormones, they produce byproduct, they produce metabolites, they break things down. And whatever they produce affects our body. So it's very much a symbiotic relationship where we really, really need to kind of feed our body the right way, move our body the right way so that our gut is happy and the bacteria is happy and healthy. And so it can keep us healthy. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Uh, speaking of uh, moving your body in the right way, you mentioned earlier doing those memorial mm -hmm. stairs. If any of the viewers want to go and catch the crew that does the stairs, when do you make that run on your, because you do it every day, you said, despite the weather? Oh, no, not every day. Oh, my goodness. That would be a lot. <laughs> it was every week. So every Saturday morning at 7.30 a.m. So that's when we meet at the bottom of the stairs and we run up and down the stairs 10 times. Usually there's a group of maybe uh, 10, 15 of us that do it. Um, and uh, we did it when it was minus 35 out this winter and that was pretty fun i would say <laughs> yeah that's good when you got a crew like that yeah. too shout out uh we maple and boc team building 7 30 a.m we're doing the stairs <laughs> <laughs> I was saying no. yeah that's a serious commitment and uh yeah, i've always admired uh people that um like say they're going to do something and then they stick to it despite the weather mm -hmm. there's this young lady i know out in vancouver and she runs every day for like 90 minutes she's a marathon runner and despite the rain despite anything just committed every day does 90 minutes for like the last two and a half years and it's just it really takes something when you make a commitment like that yes yeah exactly and i think it's nice to also have that so you know that this is something that kind of gets you going it's almost like a form of a purpose that you do. This is a part of who you are. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. call them, um, I can't remember if it was, uh, Huberman and Dr. Andrew Huberman mm -hmm. or, um, but the, uh, a non-negotiable. Right. Yeah. That's a term. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, for me, I, I started with intermittent fasting about five mm -hmm. years ago and I would skip supper. Mm -hmm. And then uh, over time after two or three years, then I just wasn't hungry at lunch. Okay. Or excuse me, I'd skip breakfast and then it moved to skipping, lunch mm -hmm. and then now for the last two years i only eat i have a feeding window between four and eight okay i consume as much food in that period yeah. but that dip that i used to get you were mentioned blood sugar yeah um that dip in energy if i'm sleeping correctly i don't mm -hmm. get the dip anymore i wake up at 5 a.m and then right through till 9 p.m it's the same energy level amazing typically yeah. Um, yeah. but if I'm, if my sleep's less than five hours, then, um, then I do get the, get the dip. Yeah. Yeah. Sleep is super important, uh, for just allowing our body to recover and rest from whatever we did the day before. Right. Uh, so five hours, that's, that's impressive. I'm very impressed that you're able to function five hours, at least for myself, that would be very low for me. No, <laughs> I, no, I can't function. Oh, you can't if function. No, oh, at least seven. Oh, at least seven. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I find even memory, uh, mm -hmm. like postal codes or uh, yes. anything, if I, it, immediately, if I don't get that sleep, mm -hmm. it's the whole day is like thrown off. Yes. Yeah. Sleep is very important. I'm with you on that. I need about seven to eight hours of sleep a night. Yeah. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. So what's coming up for Kale Health Canada? Do you guys do any events or are you out in the community? Community? Do you have other uh, team members? How can people find you? Yeah, so people can definitely find me online. It's kalehealth.ca. That's our website, kale as in the vegetable. And we're also on social media, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, all these different things. So it's a kalehealth.md for those handles. And so coming up for us is really exciting because we're always branching out, adding new partners, new services into our program. So what's happening right now is that we're basically going to be adding personalized exercise programming for all of our clients, access to daily uh, recommendations for just seven easy exercises that you do based on your health data from the previous day. So if you didn't sleep well, you may need a different set of exercises versus if you slept really well and have lots of energy. 
And so that's one thing that we're going to be integrating very soon. Another one is for those who live in Calgary, uh, we have access to in-person exercise physiologists to help people who may have had some kind of sports injury to get back to exercising. Because moving your body is still very much an important part in controlling your blood sugar and your overall health. So helping people to navigate that and also having a virtual option, option as well for exercise physiologists, booking. We have virtual mental health counseling available for our clients on a monthly basis. And we're actually going to be partnering with some food pro, uh, companies for alternative meat products so that um, the members can get access to some discounted options for those who are in the process of switching over to maybe more plant-based eating. So lots of different things coming up. It's very exciting right now. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. And uh, is there anything else that you want to leave uh, the audience with? Our three fans that we have <laughs> of the Wee Food Show. What uh, advice do you want to leave them with as far as their health is concerned? Yeah, so such a great question. And I think what I'll do is I'll leave you guys with three tips, just very simple things on how to control your blood sugar on a daily basis that you can start right now. One is to preload your meals. So when I say that, I mean eating your food in a sequence that prevents blood sugar spikes. So the first thing to eat would be some kind of fiber, whether it's a small salad, some chia pudding, something with some fiber in it that then allows your body to absorb all these other things slowly. Yeah. So preload your meal with fiber, first thing. Okay. And just by preloading your meal with fiber, you can decrease your blood sugar spike by up to 75%. So it's a huge, huge bonus. Second thing, eat your meal slowly over 30 minutes to an hour. So I know nowadays super busy and sometimes I'm guilty of that as well. I, between clients, between patients, I'm just shoving food in my mouth because I only have X amount of time. But by eating your meal over 30 minutes to an hour, you allow your body to recognize that, oh, I've started eating. Okay, now I'm getting fed. Okay, now I'm full. So you allow your body to go through the hormone process and the hormone changes so that you don't get the big ups and downs in your sugar. You get more of a slow rise and then a slow down. Okay, so that's the second thing. The third thing would be to walk for 20 minutes after a meal. Okay, just by going for a short walk for 20 minutes, you can decrease your blood sugar spike with each meal drastically, okay? You don't have to go for a fast jog, fast run, or fast walk. Just a simple stroll down the hallway between meetings if you're at work or walk around your house. So those are three things that people can start right now and I think it'll make a pretty big difference for everybody. Excellent, well, yeah. thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me.